This next conversation just blew me away. One, I have no idea how we were so blessed to get Kirk Whalem to sit down with us, but he did. And it was an incredible blessing and inspiration to me personally, and I know he will be to you as well. Kirk Whalem is a world-renowned jazz saxophonist and songwriter with Memphis roots. You may know him from his saxophone solo in Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You, not to mention he is a Grammy Award winner. He is crazy talented, but here's what I loved most about our time together, was hearing on a more personal level how his faith and music intertwine. This episode is all about finding the good, how in the midst of this challenging season, we can find be, and seek the good around us. And just as a reminder, the two things I want to be a part of all of these episodes are first, stories. I really want to get personal with people. And second, some sort of encouragement or challenge or action step that's going to help us do this day in, day out. All right, check out the Green Chair Conversation with Kirk Whalen. Okay, Kirk, what an honor to have you here with us in our green chair conversation. Um, now, <laughs> uh, so one of the things I was actually just talking to you about is one of the things I have loved about watching your interviews um, that is so unique is your faith just like permeates from everything you say, everything you do. And I really want us to dive into that. But first, I want to start with Memphis. Yeah. You could have lived anywhere. You've traveled all over the world and you are living in Memphis. We talked about this mutual love we have for Midtown. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Memphis. Why Memphis? Well, I said out loud, um, I think in unison with my wife, who is my girlfriend, I met her when I was 15 and I'm 62. Wow. Uh, we both said that mm -hmm. we would never, ever live in Memphis. Oh, wow. And so when you say something you're never going to do and you add ever <laughs> to it, just look for God to go, okay, that's going to go on a list of things I'm probably going to just do <laughs> because you said that. And sure enough, um, when my father was, was ailing and I had a feeling it was it, you know, we said, let's, let's move home long enough to just kind of see him through. And then uh, we, we were heading to New York. It's like we had lived in Paris, we lived in LA, and we had never lived in New York because mm. we're urban animals and that's where we yeah. were headed. Yeah. All the kids were out of house, you know, to college and on to their lives. And uh, so we got here and it took about a month for us to go. Oh my goodness, this is just not the Memphis we wow. remember. Wow. And it just stuck on us, you know, yeah. <laughs> I say like napalm, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Memphis, it, once it gets in your system, you, yes. it's, it's like, oh God, I literally on the way here, driving here, I said, God, thank you that you allowed me to be living here. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I just love this town and, and I didn't love yeah. it when yeah. I left here to go away. Mm but I love it now. Yeah, now born and raised Memphis? Born and raised in Memphis. I met my wife when I was, you know, headed to, to Baptist camp. They used to call it Baptist Youth Encampment <laughs> in the black uh, denomination I was in. And uh, yeah, saw her on the bus on the way there and I went, ah, this is inconvenient because I was gonna meet somebody from another town. That was the whole point. <laughs> I'm like, it's gonna be really hard to beat this lady right here that I'm looking at, but. I never did. Yeah, yeah. And so how did, you are an incredibly talented musician. Thank you. Saxophone player. Yeah. Um, now tell me, how did you even get into that? Saxophone really was sort of in the cards for me. I didn't realize it so much, hmm. but um, but it was. And yeah. it's sort of things that happen in, in your life that are huge. Yeah. They're partly you kind of making a choice, and they're, but they're partly sort of fate. It was like, this is what you're meant to do. My uncle was an amazing saxophone player. Mm. It's funny saying it was now because he just passed away mm. Christmas, but he was that guy where I heard what I was doing on the instrument and then up close and personal, I heard what he was playing mm. and I went, I, it, I'll never be that good <laughs> ever. And um, later on, I was able to produce a record on him. His name was Peanuts. Yes. Uh, his nickname was Peanuts, and he, and he was, a, he was a, a lounge lizard, man. He played at so many bars and clubs in the St. Louis area and, and all over, because he used to tour with, with Nat King Cole. But, mm. but he was an amazing musician, and uh, he was about 5'3", oh, wow. thus the name Peanuts. But, but he was huge. He was larger mm. than life for me. And so playing the saxophone, 
uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I had heard him when I was younger, yeah. when, when I was 12, and I went to Sherwood Junior High here in Memphis. Mm. You know, they did all the instruments, and then they did the saxophone last. Mm. And I was like, what was all that other noise? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was like Dustin, right? That's it. Was it. And I always knew that yeah. I wanted to play music for a living. And, and, and by the way, I mean, I am a touring musician. Like, I, yeah. the unfortunate news for me right now is that my living is about 85% uh, itinerant. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, right now is unusual. Yeah. And it's very difficult. Um, but, you know, God is gracious. You know, Ruby says that he keeps us eating out of his hands. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, That's smart. I mean, she's, a, it sounds like, she's very God, wise. You know, yeah. <laughs> she, you know, basically you say, he has to keep you close, mm -hmm. you know, in order for you to eat out of his hand. Mm -hmm. And you just jumped right in there. And that's where I want to kind of go is this idea of, I mean, you're like a huge chunk of your career, right? It's built mm -hmm. on large gatherings. Mm -hmm. It's built on concerts. And that has taken a massive shift since right. since March. So, I mean, how has that adjustment been for you both, like professionally and, and yeah. personally? Start with professionally again. You know, yeah. eighty five percent of my of my income yeah. stream yeah. went away. Now, you know, we've been able to sort of scratch and claw into some other areas, and you know, and I'm thankfully, you know, I get a check every month from from streaming. You know, yeah. like if somebody yeah. plays, you know listens to my music on Spotify or whatever, or on their TV, then I, there's an aggregate sort of, you know, algorithm that mm -hmm. they use to figure mm -hmm. out how many pennies they're going to give us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, but those, but those pennies have come in very handy. Um, and then, you know, I'm a driven person, okay. you know, I like, you know, I'm practicing all the time. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm not at home, if I'm on the road, I'm still practicing. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm home, I'm practicing, you know, because I set out to be the very best that I could possibly be. And it was, you know, that's sort of um, kind of unique to jazz music when it comes to, you know, being an entertainer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a rap artist, a country artist, you know, they can kind of, you know, a pop artist and go and just sort of do what you do. Mm -hmm. There are other ways that you work hard at it. I'm yeah. not saying that. Yeah. But the virtuosity piece mm -hmm. of it. Is, is unique to jazz and classical. Yeah. What's been most surprising in this? Like, what has been maybe something good that has, has come oh, out of Oh, yeah, that? there's lots of good. Um, one big surprise was that we ended up with um, three of our kids and three mm. of our grandkids living at the house. Um, they were all just moving to Memphis, uh, th that place, again, that I just never thought they would want to live because none of them grew up here. That's a sweet time, though. It's I mean, awesome. When else would you ever, I mean, oh, that's that, so Again, sweet. that is the positive. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, just, you know, before I left, you know, my two girl uh, grandkids at the house, the two and the four year old, uh, we're naked uh, because <laughs> it's what they do. Our yes, backyard, yes. fortunately, is discreet, you know. And uh, so they just they kick their clothes off the second they're done with lunch and they're out in the back. They're naked and they're in the little pool. And, uh, you know, it's yeah, it's just the most beautiful serendipity mm. in the world. Mm. And speaking of good, so I, I want to change gears a little bit on that. With uh, So in an interview a little over a year ago, you were asked this question, and I just absolutely loved your, your answer to that. And the question was, what does good sound like? Mm -hmm. And the concept behind that was like, what is good music? What is a good musician? And you talked a little bit about, um, I, I want you to explain that. I think that was, it was, I, it was, it was a phenomenal Well, answer. I'd be interested to know what I said. <laughs> I, I, there's no telling uh, what I said. You, you, uh, you touched on the idea of just kind of offering your authentic self. Like good oh, isn't necessarily yeah. about... Um, good isn't necessarily about how fantastic you are at a yeah, talent, yeah. how awesome, but it's kind of about offering yourself and how scary that is. Yeah, is at times. vulnerable place. Yes, um, yes. And that is, that is something that really is the great equalizer. Yes. You know, again, so we talk about jazz music, the music that I pursue, uh, and, and it involves virtuosity, like, mm. you know, muscle memory yes. and like scales. I'm writing a book with scales and stuff. That's another serendipity. <laughs> I'm doing some stuff that I've been saying I was going to do. So there's all these things that I'm working on, right? But, but that doesn't make me better than the next person in terms of being good. You know, yes. like this person can sit there with a guitar and break your heart. Yes. Uh, or mend your heart. Yes. You, you Right? So to me, that is good. That's what good is. It's like being who you, <clears throat> who you are. The series, um, I just did a, a documentary called Humanité, which is the French mm. for humanity. 
And I went around to seven other countries, and including eight, including this one. And I did, you know, collaborations with with young artists. Uh, they called me Unkirk, <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah, from Indonesia, Nigeria, France, uh, South Africa, Kenya, on and on. But the thing that 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 I was able to sort of make my point is that so here's a young singer writer from Jakarta, actually from Malaku Island in Indonesia, and she's just singing her song. She's singing her life, yes, singing her story, yes, yes, being her authentic self. And it just, when I heard her, I was eating lunch at the Java Jazz Festival in Jakarta, and I'm like, what is that? It's like, okay, I didn't hear like the virtuosity that yes. normally gets my attention. Yes. You know, somebody, eh, whatever. <laughs> it was just, she was just singing the, the story mm. of her life mm. and her people. Mm. And it just got me by the jugular. And I was able to meet her, and I'm like, I'm an old guy from the state. Well, would I love to make some music with you? Yes. And yes. so we did. And we did that all over, and we yes. did a documentary. Yes, that's really fantastic. So good is, is all about that. I feel like that translates to everyone, whether we're a musician, uh, whether we're not a musician. I feel like we can take that and say, like, okay, we can find good, and we can offer our good you know, to the world around us. And speaking yes. of good, I just said we have a... Um, uh, mutual love, Mana House, um, yes. and I want to get into that. But first, something people don't know about you. You're an ordained minister. I am, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I studied, uh, I eventually got around to it yeah. uh, uh, in my 50s uh, at uh, Memphis Theological Seminary, yes. which, which, you know, place, which is the place that I left my head because <laughs> <laughs> they ripped it off. Um, but, it, but it's a great thing because uh, I went in just mm. thinking, well, yeah, we're going to have Bible studies and I'm so good at Bibles. You know? <laughs> and boy, they were like, oh, no, that's not what we're going to do that's here. That's not what it's about. Yeah. yeah. And boy, but it was just, uh, just so amazing. Of course, based on scripture. But yeah, I love that place. And I love Manor House, which is, I was, Took a class where they you know, said, well, this class doesn't meet on campus. It meets at a place called Manor House. I'm like, what's that? And sure enough, it's a, radical, it's a place of radical hospitality for, yes. for those who have been made poor or those who are in the margins. And um, man, it just it changed me forever. Mm. And uh, to this day, I still feel like I, I want to be like some of those guests. Yes. You know, yes. uh, we call them the guests, like we're the hosts, and, yes. uh, volunteers, and our guests, you know, they teach us what it means to live yes. uh, in a context of the harshness of poverty, um, but living lives of dignity yeah. and grace. Yeah. And so you do something real special up there every week, yeah? Oh, yeah, I cut hair there. I'm, I'm the... I'm You're the a uh, Pastor Rufus calls you a closet barber. Yeah, I'm, 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 the, <laughs> I'm the closet barber. I'm the hack barber. Uh, I was, you know, I tried to get out. They kept pulling me back in. And... Uh, yeah, I just trying to. I was trying to figure out what is it that I could do here that is a real need. You know, I think, you know, arguably the real need is to be in community and to mm. just share, to listen, mm -hmm. to just be together. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of the main thing of Manor House. But I'm like, I would like to be doing something else while I do that. Yeah. And I'm like, I used to cut my son's hair, you know, <laughs> and you know, I cut. We cut our hair, you know, in college. We used to cut each other's hair to save money. Um, so I, I ended up getting really good at it uh, there at Manor House. You know, that's another thing I can thank them for is yes. a, a workshop. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Now, of course, with the pandemic, it's just been yeah. crazy. Like I've only cut one time since the pandemic and I'm like masked up and I got a big mm -hmm. face shield mm -hmm. and, you know, I've got on gloves. And, and I normally like one of the main things I like doing is after I cut their hair, I'll take some disinfectant or alcohol or whatever and I just rub their head mm. with it. And I think that um, that part of it to me is important, is special, because you know a lot. One of the things that many people uh, on the margins don't have is physical touch. Yeah. In fact, the statistics about people who go uh, into um, you know the uh, sex trade, you know, in terms of, of of frequenting you know prostitutes and stuff, is because frankly they're not they never get touched. Mm. So it's not as much about sex as it is about just being touched. Mm. And um, so that big part of it is just, you know, rubbing their head and their neck and all of that yeah. with, with alcohol yeah. or whatever, I can't do right now. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but I, I, you know what, I just put it on my gloves <laughs> and I rubbed it anyway. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah that's, that's powerful. That really is powerful. And, and 
part of it too is like I, I can just see even as you're talking how much you're even like being an ordained minister mm. and hearing your music it just I mean tell me how that shapes everything that you do you know I think the fact that you know I, I went to seminary and became ordained you know at 52 or something like that is almost you know almost inconsequential because <laughs> all that time since I first made my first record I, I, I was I guess 26 and it said dear listener God loves you and wants you back mm. that was the message on the back of my LP mm. by the way because there was no such thing as CDs or any of that and um, it's always you know I, I, I think you know my dad is my biggest mentor because you know and, and role model because you know I would just sit there every day every Sunday and and listen to him preach mm. And Rufus reminds me a lot of my dad. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Uh, but just, you know, I, I always saw myself standing there hmm. doing something, hmm. you know. And in this case, you know, I, I do go out and preach every now and then, but it's just not, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not, it's not my main thing. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm called to play the saxophone. Mm -hmm. But it opens a door for me to share. And, and the thing that I'm learning, and, it's, and again, I'm, I'm 45 years into the learning of it, uh, I'm learning how to communicate my faith in, in context with the secular mainstream reality uh, where people will hear it. Yeah. So I, I've learned through trial by fire, uh, <laughs> playing in clubs in Houston in the early 80s and, and all the way up and down the line, of how to, to be a Christian in the marketplace and not so much, you know, e, you know evangelizing the yes. world from, yes. the, from, uh, from behind the saxophone mic, you know, but it's a, it's a way of living. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I'm going for. Hmm. It's like learning to be a Christian, not speak Christian, right? Like yeah. to live it, not just talk about it. That's yeah, it. that's good. That's good. Okay, so Pastor Rufus told me this amazing story about the solo you did, your sax mm -hmm. solo and the iconic Whitney Houston, I Will Always Love You. I want to hear about that story. Yes, so um, I find that, you know, God always takes the stuff that um, you sort of just do because you're there, <laughs> you know, and that's the stuff you will use to do extraordinary things. You know, hmm. a, a theologian once told me, he said, you know, I was talking about, man, I want to, you know, be in the pulpit. I just feel like I should be pastoring and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what, man? This is what, what God told Moses. He said, what's that in your hand? Hmm. Right? Moses was like, a stick, <laughs> you know, a rod. He's like, yeah, I'm going to use that, mm. right? And so for me, that's a saxophone. What is it for you? You know, that mm. we all have, we can yeah. all answer that question. These guys have a camera, you know, yeah. I mean, that this is what it is. Yeah. And yeah. so I am there because I got the, the job to play for Whitney Houston. Someone said, you played with Whitney Houston? No, I played for her. <laughs> I worked for her. I had a check coming every two weeks, you know, and that's... Interesting. I had never had that as a jazz musician, you know, uh -huh. like a check coming every uh -huh. two weeks. So anyway, there I am playing, and um, one of the things on the itinerary was to do this scene. She knew she had shot the movie, but there was a couple of scenes left, mm -hmm. and here's this scene with, you know, Kevin Costner. Yes. And so they're there, and she's going to sing this big song to him, mm -hmm. basically yes. ending up the movie, I Will Always Love You. We heard the song that day, and we're all like, wow. You know, and later on, by the way, I got a chance to play with Dolly Parton mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. wrote that song, and she's awesome. Mm -hmm. but anyway, so we, we, so we played the song, uh, but what I found out later was getting to that moment, she had insisted that the song be, that she do the song live to film. Mm -hmm. Like literally, when you hear her sing, she's singing in the film. Mm -hmm. That's a very big deal, and it's yeah. not been done. Before her, it wasn't done almost ever. But when she said that, man, the directors, you could just, you know, yeah. according to Ricky Minor, you could say you could just see them going like, oh, God, <laughs> no, you know, we got to deal with this. And then she said, I'm not done. <laughs> she says, and I want my band, my band, hmm. to be there playing live with me as we <laughs> perform this song for the movie. And you could just tell, like, everybody was picking what bar they were going to after this <laughs> meeting. And so sure enough, um, they told it eventually, you know, that, oh, yeah. Whitney, that's a great idea. <laughs> eventually they said, you know what, Whitney, we can't do that. 
I mean, it would be awesome, but see, we've got audio and everything's mixed together. We can't do that. But, you know, we've got to shoot the scene 25, 30 times because, we, you know, or more. So we've got to get makeup and lighting and blah, 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 and wardrobe. And I'm like, we just can't do it. She finally said, well, then you got a problem. She said, because you're going to have to find a singer. Because hmm. if I do it, I'm going to sing it live and my band is going to play. Hmm. And she basically dropped the mic, you know, and left. And so, as history will prove, um, we were yes, there. Yes. And um, you can't see us in the scene. We were there, literally, behind a huge yeah. thing like this, because you know, again, audio they had to like separate everything. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, what I what I appreciate about her a is that she insisted on us mm. playing. B the fact that her band was basically a black band and a white girl on keyboards, you know, so I'm like just all straight up minority, yeah. you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought, you know, that was important, mm. you know, and I still think it, because I know what they were gonna do. They're like, oh no, but then we'll have a track mm. done and you sing just pantomime and then later you come sing your track and the track, please believe me, was gonna be all white musicians, maybe one black person. Wow. You know, that's wow. just Hollywood, that's yeah. the way it works. Yeah, that's interesting. And so we were on it. And then later I got to thinking about Oh, and by the way, the song, when you hear that song, when you hear Whitney Houston sing, I Will Always Love You, you are listening to the first time, the first take. Wow. Right? And not only that, you're listening to what we call the rough mix. So, like, you know, when we're here today, maybe guys have a, a you know, separate file that they're doing that is, this is exactly what happened. Yeah. You know, it's just stereo. It's not like the drums and then, you know, the snare drum, the kick drum, the bass, yes. the block. It's yes. not, yes. not multi track, just stereo. And that is not a record, yeah. <laughs> you know. And it has little effects on it, you know, little reverb, whatever, just so you can enjoy it while we're waiting till we're gonna go and strip it down and yes. start over with post, right? Post production. Yeah. No. When you hear that record, you hear the digital audio tape, it's called it that, that David Foster, the producer, somebody brought him up earlier, that David Foster handed Clive Davis at, at, at Arista Records. And, and, they, and Clive listened on headphones, and he's like, tearing up, he's like, this is it. Wow. And Dave's like, I know, I know, right? Right, he, he said, man, when I, you just wait, and I'm gonna add this, some of the strings, and the blah, blah, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Clive Davis is like, no, this is it. Wow. So, David Foster is like, cussing, you know. <laughs> what the, what do you mean this, you know, I got, I'm a producer, what, what yeah. this is it. So God was able to do mm. in that moment mm. the extraordinary with just some people. See, she knew she needed us there because we were, I say that humbly, because we didn't just play with her. We prayed for her mm. constantly. I was, she called me Bishop. My nickname for seven years was Bishop because I did Bible studies for the band. I was the one that would pray most of the time mm. before we go on stage. Mm. But she knew that she was covered, that she was, she was buttressed by hmm. people of faith, not just me. Wow. Ricky Minor, who you see on TV all the time, yeah. you know, yeah. Amer American Idol, blah, 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 all of the whole band. Wow. You know, even the, 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 the um, percussionist was a Muslim, but he, and he was right there praying with us. Wow. So I just have like a million questions I just want to ask you now after that. It's so good. But um, what I want to do, last question, is I like to end this on like a really, really practical note to kind of give yeah. people something to take home, give people something to help us in our day to day. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I'm really sensing with you is just this idea of good, right? Like the idea with Mana House kind of offering something, mm -hmm. the idea of good music, good musician offering our authentic self. And even in just what you were saying is just kind of like being our self, you know, and um, so what would your like one encouragement, one advice, one challenge uh, on just how we can find good? Because this yeah. is a difficult season, even for you. I mean, you're living it, you know, yeah. this is hard. Mm -hmm. um, so how are you like, how are you finding good and how can we find good? Yeah. Well, you say end on a practical note. You know, I think, you know, B flat is a, is a good sort of practical, <laughs> just <laughs> terrible job. Um, so in the Psalms, it says, you know, who, who will show us any good? Right? Mm -hmm. And that scripture always sticks out to me because I feel like, you know, even as a Christian for, for many, many years, I feel like I was a part of the kind of evangelical juggernaut mm -hmm. that was so busy 
kind of was a, the Jesus show for mm -hmm. each other. Hmm. And, 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 to, and to prove a point and to make sure people knew that we were right and they were wrong. Mm -hmm. As, you know, I guess it was Francis or, or Augustine who said, you know, yeah, you, you need to live the gospel. You can preach the gospel, but just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so essentially, like what I what I feel like I'm hearing you say is is that like loving others is like finding good is essentially just like doing good. Finding good is about loving other people, right? About investing in them, and not necessarily yeah. about having to. And I think maybe being a mirror. Hmm. hmm. You know. Yeah. Like you're gonna basically reflect the good. Yeah. In someone that you've seen, that you know God sees, depends on how you hold the mirror, right? Yeah. And that maybe you can help them see. Yeah. Like, wow, you know, yeah. you are such, this guy, uh, Benny is his name, he, he actually, uh, he does these, his clothes, he, he, he designs his own clothes, he takes those fabric strips and stuff, you know, neckties, and he'll go up and down, you know, the leg, and there's studs and stars, and and he, he gave me a present one time. It was hmm. okay. Take a deep breath. <laughs> it was a necktie with pen. It is a necktie because it's hanging in my studio with pennies glued from the top all the way down. And I thought, what a symbol of, like the, the, the paradox of value, mm. right? How much is that tie worth? Who knows where he got that tie? It was an old clip on black tie. And the pennies, yeah, so I counted them up. I think it was like 27 pennies. Mm. So is that... Is that tie worth 27 penny? Hmm. Or a million bucks? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's, <laughs> that's more than it, that's powerful. I mean, yeah. that is, that's life changing. Yeah, he showed me some good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I hung it up. Yeah. Well, what a, what a cool, experience, you know, to be here with you and share this. Yeah, yeah. This time. And I don't know that everybody knows this, but we actually have that shared experience and love and heart for, for Mana House. I didn't oh, say that man, with everybody, yeah. but that has been, um, just seeing your heart and seeing your passion. Um, yeah. The music piece is obvious. You sure, know, we sure, can sure. get on. We can get on YouTube. We can, we can see you. We can listen yeah. to you, and it's incredible. Yeah. But hearing the faith piece is, is game changer. Sure. You know? I, I mean, that's kind of the heartbeat, it feels like, of every single yeah. thing you do. And that is what makes it so powerful. People call me, you know, they say, oh, you play so soulful, you know, in a secular or mainstream context. It's like soulful. How do you do that? You know, young sax players trying to do, ah, he played this like that. It's like, no, man, it's not that. It's about playing with conviction. Mm. Like, basically, you're convicted about this a relationship with someone or you're convicted about some truth mm. and it comes through. Your yeah, music, you know? yeah, that's powerful. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so, so much glad. for being here with us. And that's a wrap for our Green Chair Conversations with Kirk Whalem. Don't forget the conversation doesn't have to stop here. If you want to connect further, comment below or email us at greenchair at hopechurchmemphis.com. This way you can get connected and we'll be offering some additional resources on how you can take this conversation beyond the chair. Love you guys. See you next week.